Welcome to A Look Ahead. We're delighted you've decided to join us. We study the Sabbath <coughs> School lessons that's prepared by the Seventh-day Adventist Church, and this series is entitled, In These Last Days, The Message of Hebrews. Maybe you didn't think Hebrews was about the last days, but let's see if we can figure that out. This is lesson number four in our series for January 22 of 2022, entitled Jesus, Our Faithful Brother. What would that include? Well, as always, we'd like to ask you to join us in prayer as we begin. Our wonderful Father, what can we say that hasn't already been said in the scriptures so clearly? And yet so few people have managed to put it together in a very cogent and very meaningful way about all that, all that is said about your character and your government. Now as we think about the ways that Jesus came to join us here on this earth as a human being and to take upon himself our nature for the rest of eternity, amazing stuff. What, what should we learn from that is our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Last week we talked about all of the implications, not all of them, I, we, that's an exaggeration, some of the implications from Hebrews 1. And here's a comparison just to give you some ideas, Jim. Comparing Hebrews 1 with Hebrews 2 paints a picture of contrast in Hebrews 1. Christ is the superior to the angels, Hebrews 1, 6, whereas in Hebrews 2, he is inferior, inferior to the angels, at least for a certain time, Hebrews 2, 9. In Hebrews 1, Christ is close to God. At his right side, Hebrews 1, 13. In Hebrews 2, Christ is close to and not ashamed of us, excuse me, of us, his brother, that includes excuse me, his brethren, too. Hebrews 2, 11, contrasting the pre-incarnate Christ to human nature, Hebrews tells us that Christ adopted flesh and blood in order to be like us, Hebrews 2, 14. Jesus, that is Christ, also died as we humans do, Hebrews 2, 14. Yeah, let's be clear. Um, this is just a technical point, but technically, Jesus is, the, his, is his human name and Christ is his divine name. It's not really correct to say that Christ died. That's his divine nature. Divine nature can't die. Jesus is the one who died. Um, so that's why I put that little word Jesus in there. Well, Christ, Christ is, is, comes from the, what, Mashiach, the, the Hebrew, Messiah. Ma, ma, the, the anointed. Yeah. Uh, and uh, Jesus, or it comes from Yahshua or Joshua, yeah. who is, means healer, Yeah. right? Christ also died as we do, as we humans do, Hebrews 2.14. But the big difference between our death and his death, that his, and his, is that his death accomplished what our death never could. His death freed us, who, excuse me, freed us all, who all, who all in lives were held in slavery by the fear of death. Hebrews 2.15 from the New Art Revised Standard Version. Christ is like us, yet because bit different from us. He was truly human, without, yet without sin. Hebrews 4, 15. Like Moses, who chose shame over, the, over fame. Hebrews eleven twenty five. 25. Christ despised the shame of, of becoming human and dying on the cross, but accepted it anyway. He became like us so that we might become like him. In our becoming like him, he is not ashamed to call us brethren, Hebrews 2.11. Even when we might put him to open shame, Hebrews 6.6 6 of the New American Standard Bible, humans go through trial and testing, which produce endurance and finally maturity of character. Paul describes Jesus in a similar manner. He learned obedience through though excuse me, through what he suffered and was made perfect, Hebrews 5, 8, and 9, New Revised Standard Version. Now, excuse me, how did Jesus learn obedience? At some point in time, he was, was, dis he? was he disobedient? Don't, don't make that, a statement, make it a question. <laughs> I didn't want to make a statement. 
That notion should contradict Hebrews 4.15, which says Jesus was tested in every point as we are, yet he remained without sin. Adult Bible Teachers Study Guide. And I couldn't think of a better way to put those contrasts, so I just quoted from our Bible study guide. Incredible contrast. Paul, Paul is just saying, look at this, and look at this, and look at this, and look at this, and contrasting his divinity with his humanity. In the Old Testament, God made provisions for the Israelites that a person could be bought back if, for one reason or another, he had to sell his property or even himself into slavery to pay his debts. And unfortunately, there's very, very sad stories going on even now in Afghanistan after the, what happened there, people selling their children, yes. selling their young, young, young girls to become some older man's wife, etc., to pay their debts. It still goes on. To buy food. Even. To buy food, yeah. yeah. That's a quite a religion, isn't it? Yeah. It's a political system, but... Well, okay, in the Old Testament, God made provisions for the Israelites, we mentioned that. Uh, let's read about that, Carrie. Reading from Leviticus chapter 25, 20, verses 25 to 27 and 47 to 49. If an Israelite becomes poor and is forced to sell his land, his closest relative is to buy it back. Anyone who has no relative to buy it back may later become prosperous and have enough to buy it back. In that case, he must pay to the man who bought it a sum that will make up for the years remaining until the next year of restoration, when he would in any event recover his land. Suppose a foreigner with you becomes rich while a fellow Israelite becomes poor and sells himself as a slave to that foreigner or to a member of his family. After he is sold, he still has the right to be bought back. One of his brothers or his uncle or his cousin or another of his close relatives may buy him back, or if he himself earns enough, he may buy his own freedom. That's from American Bible Society, Holy Bible, the Good News Translation, okay. New York American Bible Society. Okay. <coughs> now, you can guess what's going on here. This, our lessons are preparing us for the idea that someone else came as our close relative to buy us back. And let's think about the implications of that. Remember that every 50 years, the property was to be in the Jewish system, property was to be returned to its original owner whether or not he could pay. However, 50 years is a long time to wait. So God made the additional provision that a person or even his property could be bought back. That special provision was known as the nearest relative provision. Remember the story of Ruth and Boaz, the nearest relative willing to pay for their land that Ruth's family had owned. That nearest relative would also be the one responsible for pursuing anyone who might have murdered a relative. He came to be known in that case as the Avenger of the Blood, Numbers 35, 9 through 15. That was the reason God provided cities of refuge in the land of Palestine. So because they didn't have an overall Supreme Court and all that kind of stuff that we are used to having today, where you could appeal to things, it was expected that if you did something that needed to be paid on your behalf or you get killed and someone needs to deal with the murder on your behalf, it's the nearest relative who is supposed to take up that responsibility. So that person is a key to, you know, many aspects of, of a person living under those circumstances. So what lessons did Paul want us to understand from those ancient Hebrew provisions? Hebrews 2, 14 through 16 says, since the children, as he calls them, are people of flesh and blood, Jesus himself became like them and shared their human nature. He did this so that through his death he might destroy the devil who has the power over death, and in this way set free those who were slaves all their lives because of their fear of death. For it is clear that it is not the angels that he helps. Instead, he helps the descendants of Abraham. 
Okay, now some of you who might have listened to last week's lesson remember that we have specifically said that Christ came to live and die to say something to the entire universe. So let's not forget that as we move our way through this lesson. Let us for not, not forget that we have sold ourselves into slavery to the devil. Jesus is offering now to come and serve as a kinsman redeemer. That's the traditional way that that's translated. But unfortunately, like Paul, we are slaves to sin, Romans 7, 14 to 24. It is not easy for us to overcome those natural tendencies, but we need to recognize the truth spelled out in Romans 6, 23. And what is that truth? For, the, for sin pays, it, pays its wage, death, but God's free gift of eternal life in union with Christ Jesus, our Lord. Good News Bible. So now you've got a contest. Here's sin, what it does, and there's God, what he does. Now, which one should we be afraid of? Death. <laughs> should be afraid of sin. Yeah. How is it that we love sin and we're afraid of God? We got this completely backwards. But the amazing thing is what we read in Hebrews 2, 11, and I quote, he purifies people from their sins, and both he and those who are made pure all have the same Father. So Jesus is saying, okay, I put my arms around all of you, and I want you all to join me in returning to our Father. That is why Jesus is not ashamed to call them his family. Think of that. Jesus, the Son of God, as spelled out in Hebrews 1, chose to take our nature and become fully human as well as remaining fully divine to come as close as possible to us. Several passages in the Old Testament talk about this. Jim? Psalms 19:14. May my words and my thoughts be acceptable to you, O Lord, my refuge and my redeemer. Good news Bible. My redeemer there, okay. Isaiah 41, 14, the Lord says, small and weak as you are, Israel, don't be afraid, I will help you. I, the holy God of Israel, am the one who saves you. Okay. Good news, and there, Yeah, there are other passages, Isaiah 45, 14, 44, 22, and Jeremiah 31, 11. Could it really be true that God wants to come closer to us than our nearest human relative. God, our supreme and infinite creator and redeemer, chooses to call us his brothers and sisters. The people to whom God was writing were being shamed by their neighbors uh, for their rejection of the Greek and Hebrew gods that others worshiped. They were ill-treated. Sometimes they lost all their property. Sometimes they even faced death all in the name of Jesus. One of the illustrations that Paul used to help us to understand the condescension on the part of Jesus Christ is the story of Moses. Gary? Reading from Hebrews chapter 11, verses 24 through 26. It was faith that made Moses, when he had grown up, refuse to be called the son of king's daughter. He preferred to suffer with God's people rather than to enjoy sin for a little while. He reckoned that to suffer scorn for the Messiah was worth far more than all the treasures of Egypt, for he kept his eyes on the future reward. That's from the Good News Bible. Okay. Moses chose to reject his high standing as a son of Pharaoh's daughter. He would have been the next Pharaoh choosing rather to allot himself with the shamed slaves that were his relatives. So what does God ask from us in exchange for this incredible condescension on the part of Jesus? Matthew 10, 32 and 33. For those who declare publicly that they belong to me, I will do the same before my Father in heaven. But if anyone rejects me publicly, I will reject him before my Father in heaven. Good News Bible. And right. again, 2 Timothy 1, 8 and 12. Do not be ashamed then of witnessing for our Lord, nor be ashamed of me, a prisoner for Christ's sake. Instead, take your part in suffering for the good news, as God gives you the strength to do it. Let me interrupt for just a second. 2 <laughs> Timothy, when was that written in Paul's life? What point in Paul's life? Pretty late, wasn't it? 
very late. This was the very last thing he wrote. He knew that he was, he was just about to lose his head, just about to be cut off. And so he has, at, at least he's been in prison almost continuously for about six years. And so just to give you an idea of what's going on, and this wasn't some uh, nice, comfortable uh, place. This was suffering every day. Second Timothy 1, verse 12, continuing. And it is for this reason that I suffer these things, but I am still full of confidence because I know whom I have trusted, and I am sure that he is able to keep safe until that day when he has entrusted to me. You want to give us, give us Hebrews 13 as well? Uh, Hebrews 13, verses 12 and 13. For this reason, Jesus also died outside the city in order to purify the people from sin with his own blood. Let us then go to him outside the camp and share his shame, for there is no permanent city for us here on this earth, here on earth. We are looking for the city which is to come. Let us then always offer praise to God as our sacrifice through Jesus, which is the offering presented by lips that confess him as Lord, all from the Good News Bible. Yeah, so if you Think about everything he did for you and for me. Is it too much for us to speak on his behalf, even in a shameful situation, even in people are making fun of us or, or accusing us of all kinds of things? Have we ever been ashamed of our Christianity and our association with Jesus Christ, our Lord and Redeemer? Therefore, Paul challenged us to hold firmly to faith that we have professed. Okay, Hebrews 4.14. 4, Let us then hold firmly to the faith we profess, for we have a great high priest who has gone into the very presence of God, Jesus, the Son of God. Good News Bible. And from Hebrews 10, verse 23. Hold us, let us hold firmly to the hope that we profess, because we can trust God to keep his promise. Wow. Try to wrap your mind around the idea that the Son of God himself toast, chose to associate with us permanently for the rest of eternity as a human being. Why did he, or why would he do that? Back before our world was created, Jesus was Michael the archangel. He moved among the angels as if he were an angel. That may be partly why Lucifer began to feel that he should be treated the same as Jesus was. And now, shockingly, Jesus Christ has decided to come down and adopt us as his brothers and sisters. Satan wanted to move up in the level of power and authority. Jesus moved way down in the level of power and authority. He no longer is operating at the level of an angel, but rather as a descendant of Abraham. But we must not forget that the plan of salvation was for the benefit of the entire universe as well. And if you had a chance to hear our lesson from uh, last week, we went through that in great detail. But here are some verses right from the Bible itself. Ephesians 1, 7 through 10. For the blood of Christ, and that's, the everybody recognizes, or they should recognize that that's talking about his sacrificial death, his death on the cross. By that, we are set free. Okay, how does that work? That our sins are forgiven? Yeah, God is forgiveness personified. How great is the grace of God which he gave to us in such large measure. In all his wisdom and insight, God did what he had purposed and made known to us the secret plan. This is, in Greek, that's the word mystery. He had already decided to complete by means of Christ. This plan, which God will complete when the time is right, is to bring all creation together. How much is included in all creation? Everything in heaven and on earth with Christ as head. So how can we ever leave out the rest of the universe when talking about the plan of salvation? Well, if you don't think that covers it, what about these verses? Ephesians 3, 7 through 10. I was made a servant of the gospel by God's special gift, 
which he gave me through the working of his power. I am less than the least of all God's people. This is Paul talking. Yet God gave me this privilege of taking to the Gentiles the good news about the infinite riches of Christ and of making all people see how God's secret plan, there's the mystery, the secret plan again, is to be put into effect. How does God do it? That's the question he's asking. God, who is the creator of all things, kept his secret, there it is again, hidden through all the past ages, in order that at the present time, by means of the church, who does that include? Every one of us, you, me, all of us. By means of the church, the angelic rulers and powers in the heavenly world might learn of his, that's God's, wisdom in all its different forms. The, uni the universe is learning about God's wonderful love and compassion as they observe how God treats us and how we respond to the way he treats us. That's amazing. And then to round it out, Colossians 1, 19 and 20, for it was by God's own decision that the Son has in himself the full nature of God. Let's, be that, let's make sure that that's very clear. Through the Son, then, God decided to bring the whole universe back to himself. God made peace through his Son's blood, his sacrificial death, on the cross, and so brought back to himself all things, both on earth and in heaven. Jim? Maybe you could carry on there. Through the plan of salvation, a larger purpose is to be wrought, out, is to be wrought out even than the salvation of man and the redemption of the earth. Through the revelation of the character of God in Christ, the beneficence of the divine government would be manifested before the universe, the charge of Satan refuted, the nature and results of sin made plain, and the perpetuity of the law fully demonstrated. Ellen White, Signs of the Times, February 13, 1893. And read a few it, other quotations yeah, there. He quoted in other places. Notice what it says there. To the revelation of the character of God. So how does this all happen? Christ reveals the character of God. What's the result? The beneficence of the divine government would be manifested for the universe. In other words, the truth about God's rule, the charges of Satan refuted, the nature and results of sin made plain, and the perpetuity law fully demonstrated. That's spelled out pretty comprehensively, I would say. Okay, go ahead. But the plan of redemption had a yet broader and deeper purpose than the salvation of man. It was not for this alone that Christ came to the earth. It was not merely that the inhabitants of this little world might regard the law of God as it should be regarded, but as it was to vindicate the character of God before the universe. To this result of his great sacrifice, its influence upon the intelligences of other worlds, as well as upon men, the Savior looked forward to when... When? Just before forward when just before the crucifixion he said now is the judgment of this world now shall the prince of this world be cast out and i if i be lifted up from the earth i will draw all unto me john 12 31 and 32 and you know how in the king james they didn't understand the translators there didn't understand it was, well it's it's got to be all of us right so they put in the word men will draw all men unto me but they were honest enough to put in italics, which means what? It was supplied. It was supplied. It was not there. And here we see in the context, it clearly applies to how many? The whole universe. The whole universe. And that's what Jesus was talking about. Okay, go ahead. The act of Christ in dying for the salvation of man would not only be making would not only make heaven accessible to men, but before all the universe, it would justify God and his son in their dealing with the rebellion of Satan. It would establish the perpetuity of the law of God and would reveal the nature and the results of sin. Ellen White, Patriarchs and Prophets, page 68, 69. And unfortunately, I will say that uh, that passage will draw all unto me when it's repeated when this material is repeated in some books by Ellen White, they put the men back in there. 
specifically in Reflecting Christ, yeah. page 50. Yeah. Well, the plan of salvation clearly involves the entire universe and not just human beings. We were the ones in the greatest need and the ones that Satan had claimed as belonging to him. It was to us and for us that Christ came. So if you deal with people who are in the greatest need, if you have the right treatment for the worst disease, then you can take care of all the other people, right? Hebrews 10, verse 10. Carrie? Because Jesus Christ did what God wanted him to do, we are all purified from sin by the offering that he made of his own body once and for all. That's from the Good News Bible. The expression flesh and blood emphasizes the frailty of the human condition. Its weakness, according uh, to Ephesians 6.12. Ephesians, I, I got a block on that lot. 6.12, lack of understanding, Matthew 16 and 17. Galatians 1, 16, and of subjection to death, 1 Corinthians 15, 50. Hebrews says that Jesus was made like his brothers in all things, from Hebrews 2, 17. This expression means that Jesus became fully human. New English version, Jesus simply did not simply look like or seem to be human. He truly was human, truly one of us. And that's so, from Bible study guide for Tuesday, January 18. Yeah. Now this is, a, you know, this is something that's clearly, you know, misunderstood by a lot of people, even among Adventists in our day. Jesus actually inherited some human DNA. He couldn't be called the son of David if that had not been true. There's a lot of people who have the idea that God somehow came down and he just planted this perfect one-celled or multi-celled organism in Mary's womb and he grew up there, but not contaminated with any humanity. No, he, he, if that were the truth, he could not case, he, he could not be called a descendant of David. Yeah. And he was a descendant of David. So Jesus has literally taken, come on, Jesus has literally taken human nature, human DNA into his into his being, he did when he was here on this earth, so. Okay, while it is true that Jesus became fully human, there were other ways in which he was definitely not like us. From the Bible study guide for Tuesday, it says, first, Jesus did not commit any sin. You think he, that makes him different than us? Different from me. <laughs> and me. I think my or two. Yeah, no, no. <laughs> That's from Hebrews 4.15. Second, Jesus had a human nature that was, quote, holy, innocent, unsustained, separated from sinners. Hebrews uh, 7.26 in the English Standard Version, I believe it is, ESV. Yes. We all have sinned and we all have evil tendencies. We got them from our parents, Adam and Eve. So what Jesus need to do to destroy the devil? Now here's an important point. He need to, one, fully, completely, and convincingly refute all of Satan's accusations. And two, answer all of Satan's questions against the government and character of God. Thus, Jesus broke the power of sin, gave us guidance to live a righteous life according to his new covenant promise. We have the example of Jesus before us, his promise to become one of us. In fact, he, has, he promised to be a faithful and merciful high priest. And we're going to, I just tell you, we're going to get into that in a great deal more uh, in future lessons in order to help us. So why is it that so many of us still struggle with sin? I mean, aren't all these promises to God supposed still valid? How can we do better? Unfortunately, Satan is alive and well on planet Earth. We are born in sin. Sinning comes very naturally to each one of us, unfortunately. So what was required for Jesus to do in order to be a faithful high priest for us? Hebrews 5, 8, and 9. But even though he was God's son, he learned through the sufferings 
through his sufferings to be obedient. When he was made perfect, he became a source of eternal salvation for all those who obey him. And God declared him to be high priest in the priestly order of Melchizedek. Good News Bible. This should surprise us. If Jesus was the perfect Son of God, our Creator and Redeemer, why does he need to be made perfect through sufferings? We just got through saying that he didn't sin, so sure. how is he? He certainly did not have to overcome any sins or any moral or ethical imperfection. It is important to recognize in the setting of the New Testament Greek that the word perfection means maturing, growing up as a sinless human being. Did Jesus grow up at every human stage from infant to womb, from the womb to infant to toddler to young person to every stage? And he matured perfectly. That's what we're talking about here. Any questions about that? Oh, anybody that's gone through puberty understands there are <laughs> sufferings in growing up and it's not because you've done something yeah. wrong, it's just trying to figure out which way you're supposed to go. Yeah. Jesus had to live his entire, his whole perfect life um, before he could accomplish what God had sent him to do. Remember that Satan had claimed that no human being could ever do that. That is to live a perfect life here on planet Earth. So Jesus did it throughout his whole life up to and through the day he was crucified. Satan made three great claims against Christ that we need to, we need to go. He, he told his fellow beings, Ellen White talks about this, no human being has yet lived on this earth without sinning. Jesus will not be able to live his life here on this earth without sinning. And as he saw that Jesus was getting closer and closer to his final days and he still hadn't sinned, Satan said, well, okay, let me make life so difficult for him, he won't have to sin, he just have to give up on us and go back to heaven. That was his second claim. And then finally when Jesus, when he failed with that and Jesus is already in the grave, Satan and every single one of his angels was there trying to keep that grave shut. And what happened? Two angels from heaven came down. One rolled back the stone. And, we, you know, the Bible says, well, the hundred Roman soldiers fell like dead men. <laughs> that was nothing compared to the fact every Satan and every one of his angels were scattered. Yeah. There was nothing they could do. And God says, Jesus... Just as you said, you have life in yourself, come forth. And Jesus came forth in his own power. Just a silly question. But do you think that the two angels coming down from heaven and the Roman soldiers dying scared away the Satan's angels first? Or were they scared away first? They were scared they... away first. Well, the Roman soldiers didn't die. No. Well, they, they, they just faint, quote, fainted. Yeah, yeah they, they, they fell like dead men to the ground, fainted. Yeah. yeah. That is yeah. That extreme syncopal episode. Huh? Yeah. Well, you know, I think they had something to be afraid of. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Wow, it's just amazing. Okay, so Jesus grew up. He went through that whole thing. All three of those steps we've talked about, he didn't sin, he didn't give up, and he rose from the tomb. So Jesus did it through his whole life up to and through the day he was crucified. At this point, we run into some big differences in the way people explain why Jesus had to die. And we're going to see this all the way through the rest of our lessons. Some people suggest that Jesus had to die on the cross as a sacrifice so that the Father could have the legal means to save us. Okay, the legal means to save us. Jesus became the perfect offering, the only one qualified to die in our place. His, uh, you know, in, back in the early years, very early years, first, second century uh, after Christ, the idea was, uh, the ha idea that, well, there were, that what was happening is there were ships traveling around the Mediterranean, and they would pull into places, and, and people would go off, and they would find some rich, the child of some rich family, and they would kidnap him, take him onto their ship, and they said, now, if you want your child back, fork over the cash, play it like this. And so 
people got the idea that somehow or other that's what was happening with our plan of salvation. We sold ourselves into Satan's hands and God says, okay, let me make you a deal. I will give you my son in exchange for all of humanity. And Satan says, well, that's what I always wanted. I wanted to have the place of Jesus. Sure, fine. Take all the human beings. And of course, what Satan just finds out is that he can't hang on to Jesus. Jesus escapes. And so God wins the great controversy by tricking the devil. So that's one view. Well, that's, that was the view. It was back in those days. It's not the view we hold to today, but that's what a view, many people had that view many, many years ago. Jesus has adopted our humanity, has lived among us, and has proved that it is possible in contradiction to Satan's claims to live a perfect life as a human being. We needed, and we still need, to see what God is like lived out in the perfect human life. Jesus was able to destroy the devil because he was able to refute all the misrepresentations of God that the devil had been claiming. And if you heard our lesson last week, all those claims, God is arbitrary, vengeful, unforgiving, severe, etc., etc. Did Jesus accept, exemplify any of those things? No, absolutely not. So the truth ultimately destroys lies. That's what we need to know. The truth lived out by Jesus destroyed the lies that Satan had been trying to perpetrate. In Hebrews 11, Paul briefly sketches sketched the lives of some of the saints whose histories are recorded in the Old Testament. He focused particularly on Abraham. Then he told us to keep our eyes fixed on Jesus. Hebrews 12, 1 to 4. Uh, and let's just take a moment. I think we've got time. Let's read that. As for us, so if you remember the sequence, he's, he's talked about angels, he says Jesus is superior to the angels. He's talked about Moses, Jesus is superior to Moses. Jesus is a perfect example of our high priest, a perfect example of how a person should live. But let me give you some examples of people who might surprise you, and then he goes through the list in Hebrews 11. But he says, let me give you now the perfect example. And he goes to Hebrews 12, as for us, we have this large crowd of witnesses around us, the people he's just been talking about. And who are some of those people? Believe it or not, Samson and, and, and uh, Rahab and David and so forth. And the Israelites. Yes. So then, let us rid ourselves of everything that gets in the way and of the sin which holds on to us so tightly. And let us run with determination the race that lies before us. Let us keep our eyes fixed on Jesus, on whom our faith depends from beginning to end. He did not give up because of the cross. On the contrary, because of the joy that was waiting for him, he thought nothing of the disgrace of dying on the cross. And he is now seated at the right-hand side of God's throne. Think of what he went through, how he put up with so much hatred from sinners. So do not let yourselves become discouraged and give up. For in your struggle against sin, you have not yet had to resist to the point of being killed. Wow. Have not yet had to resist to the point of being killed. Considering what he went through, is there any reason for us to complain? In Hebrews 6, 20, Jesus is described as a forerunner or pioneer of the course that we need to run. He showed us what living by faith is all about. By the way, where, where, does, where did Paul say and he was, Jesus was going? Into the most holy place, before us. What does that imply? We'll talk about this more later, but we're supposed to go there too, straight into the presence of the Father. Well, try to imagine how challenging it was for Jesus to maintain his trust in God while he was dying, hanging on the cross. Can we make daily choices that confirm our trust or faith in God? How do we do that on an hour by hour, minute by minute basis? Some people have the idea that we make maybe one major decision at some point in our life. That's a very commonly taught idea. Well, I accept Jesus Christ and then, okay, there's nothing, never have to worry about anything more. Once saved, always saved, right? No, we make those choices every day on an hour by hour, a minute by minute basis. Are we choosing the selfish way, the Satan way? Are we choosing the God way, the loving way? We make those choices 
every day, every minute almost. Um, in the days in which Paul was writing, there was a Roman custom that people were aware of. If a father should die with a number of young children, an older son or perhaps a brother was appointed as a guardian. A tutor, often an older brother, became responsible for the care of minor children and their inheritance until they reached the age of majority, thus heightening the older brother's natural duty to take care of his younger siblings. And that's from a commentary, Godly Fear, the Epistle to the Hebrews and Greco-Roman Critiques of Superstition by, um, does he even, even mention who, the name of the guy, but anyway. It's quoted in our Bible study guide for Friday, January 21. Surely Jesus Christ is our elder brother. He is our tutor, our guardian, our protector, our redeemer, creator, savior. How much more can he be? So, Jim? Christ came to the earth, taking humanity and standing as man's representative to show in the controversy with Satan that man, as God created him, connected with the Father and the Son, could obey every divine requirement. Ellen White, Seculus, Selected Messages, page, Book 1, page 253. And why is that an issue? Satan had clearly claimed that it was impossible. Sure. Yeah. In his life and lessons, well, that's your, go ahead, Jim, you can. In his life and lessons, Christ has given a perfect exemplification of the, satis of the unselfish ministry, which has its origin in God. God does not live for himself. He created the world and by untouching, by, by upholding, <laughs> excuse me, and by upholding all things, he is constantly ministering for others. He maketh his son, you could, he maketh his son to rise on the evil and on the good, and sendeth him rain on the just and on the unjust. Matthew 5:45. The ideal of ministry God has committed to His Son Jesus was given to stand at the he excuse me at the head of humanity, that by His example He might teach what it might excuse me teach what it means to minister. Ellen White, The Desire of Ages, page 649. Okay, very good. Wow. Considering all of this, how foolish it would be if we turn our backs on his offer. There are at least four questions that Hebrews 5, through 7, 5, 7 through 9 raises. Let's look at that again. In his life on earth, Jesus made his prayers and requests with loud cryings and tears to God. Now, when did that happen? When was it that he made his prayers and requests with loud cries and tears to God, who could save him from death? Right on the cross? Yes, Gethsemane and on the cross. Probably we know about his For make sure those kinds of appeals in Gethsemane, don't we? But we, we don't know that this is the first time where it's, it says he, he made it with loud cries and tears. We know that he, would tear, he sweat great drops of blood, right? Do we have any evidence that he made loud cries? I don't know, but this is, this is what it says here in Hebrews. Because he was humble and devoted, God heard him. But even though, I mean, that's, you think God would listen to his son? But even though he was God's son, he learned through his suffering to be obedient. We've talked about that. When he was made perfect, fully mature, fully grown, he became the source of eternal salvation for all those who obey him. And God declared him to be high priest in the priestly order of Melchizedek. Now we're gonna talk about Melchizedek quite a lot in the future, but why, why is Jesus called a priest in the order of Melchizedek? Because Melchizedek was not a Hebrew. He wasn't even a, well, he wasn't a Levite. He wasn't even a Hebrew. Right, exactly. So here's Jesus. He's in the, he's in the tribe of Judah, so he could have qualified as a king, but he wasn't from the tribe of Levi, so how could he be a high priest? And he's going to claim to be both. So 
What does Paul do? Scavenge says that. Scavenge was not known either. Yeah. That's, he says, so the, what, how do we solve that problem? He's in the order of Melchizedek. <laughs> we don't know about his ancestors. We don't know about, about his descendants. Okay. Okay, there are at least four questions that Hebrews 5 through 7, 7 through 9 raises. First, what does it mean when it says that Christ offered prayers to God who, has, who was able to save him from death and he was heard? Didn't Jesus die? Well, we do not know really anything about those prayers that he prayed in the Garden of Gethsemane. We do know that his stress was so great that he was sweating drops of blood. And at the end of that session, he fell dying to the ground. Okay? Uh, who's next? Gary? Yes. We can have but faint conception of the inexpressible anguish of God's dear son in Gethsemane as he realized the separation from his father in consequence of bearing man's sin. I'm going to interrupt there for a second. What's happening here? He's being separated from God. Is that because he's a sinner? Of course not. He was not a sinner. But God says, let me demonstrate to you what happens when I allow sin, Isaiah 59, verse 2, allow sin to separate between me and you. This is what happens. Okay, we're going to have a demonstration. Go ahead. The divine Son of God was fainting, dying. The Father sent an angel from his presence to strengthen the divine sufferer. Could mortals view the amazement and sorrow of the angels as they watched in silent grief the Father separating his beams of light, love, and glory from his Son? They would better understand how offensive is sin in his sight. As the Son of God in the Garden of Gethsemane bowed in the attitude of prayer, the agony of his spirit forced from his paws sweat like great drops of blood. It was here that the horror of great darkness surrounded him. The sins of the world were upon him. He was suffering in man's stead as a transgressor of his father's law. Here was the scene of the temptation. The divine light of God was receding from his vision and he was passing into the hands of the powers of darkness. The wrath would have been fallen upon man was now falling upon Christ. Mm -hmm. White, G. White, Sign of the Times, August 14, 1879, paragraph 3. Okay, now let's, let's tear that apart for just a moment. We, we've got a, a little extra minute or two here. What this is, what's happening here? God, Jesus is being treated as if he were a sinner. The light of God's presence is receding from him. What does that mean? God is leaving him. He says, I want you to see what happens. There's, if this is God piling some pile of sins on him and then say, okay, now I'm taking all these sins and I'm piling them on you. He doesn't have to move sin. You can't move sins around. You can't make God, Jesus responsible for sin. You can treat him as if he were a sinner. That's what's happening here. And that's very important. So you want to know? And, <coughs> excuse me, uh, elsewhere, Ellen White says very clearly that sinners will die the kind of death that Christ died right there in the Garden of Gethsemane, and then ultimately on the cross. Second, how did Jesus learn obedience? He lived that perfect life from infancy through dying on Golgotha without sinning even once. <coughs> I'm sorry. He proved that it was possible for a human being to do that. In those final hours, he had to overcome his natural desire for self-preservation and be willing to sacrifice all for our benefit, not being able to see through the portals of the tomb. And you know we recognize that quotation from Ellen White. Third, why does Hebrews 5, 9 state that Christ was made perfect? Surely we would recognize that Jesus was perfect, perfect from his infancy and through his entire human life. Quoting from the Adult Teachers Sabbath School Bible Guide, page 54, it says, In summary, we can say that Christ's prayer to the one who was able to save him from death was heard because he prayed for God's will to be done. 
As a result, he was ultimately brought back to life. He learned obedience by submitting to and trusting in God's will. Finally, Christ was made our perfect high priest through obedience to God so that he could become, quote, the source of eternal salvation for all who obey him, end quote, meaning us. Hebrews 5, 9. Okay. Fourth. Well, I, let me just make a comment about that. Um, we've already talked about what we mean by saying that he will be made perfect. That is, he will do what? He grew up. He matured. Perfect in Greek, the word translated perfection in Greek means to grow up, to be mature. Fourth, Christ was like us, yet different from us. In what ways was he different? At no point in his life did he sin. Despite the worst possible temptations, he remained faithful to his Father's guidance for him each day. We've talked about the fact that every time that, that Christ came in direct conflict with the devil, who won? He did. Christ did. Jesus did. But he maintained his likeness to humanity all the way to the point when he died on the cross. <coughs> I'm sorry, it's Philippians 2, 5 through 11. But that was not the end of him. He already knew that his father had promised him that he would arise in his human form and return to heaven, and he trusted his father's word. And the chapter on um, It Is Finished in Desire of Ages is just unbelievably clear on that point. Many, many, many. Uh, that's something we all should have memorized, that whole chapter. Okay, Myra? Many claim that it was impossible for Christ to over be overcome by temptation. Then, then he could not have been placed in Adam's position. He could not have gained victory that Adam failed to gain. If we have in any sense a more trying conflict than had Christ, then he would not be able to succor us. Succor us. To, to help us. To help us. Okay. To our Savior took... But our Savior. But our Savior took humanity with all of its liabilities. He took the nature of man with the possibility of yielding to temptation. We have nothing to bear which he has not endured. Desire of Ages, page 117, paragraph Wow. Three. Many people would say that's heresy, but it's true. Christ endured more than any of us would ever be asked to endure. But we need to remember that those who will live through the time of the mark of the beast and the seven last plagues at the end of this earth's history will be described as enduring also. And it won't be easy, Revelation 14, 12. To many people, all of this suggests that the Father is a stern judge, high and lifted up, and the Son needed to do all these things to meet the legal requirements of the Father. That is not a correct description of the situation. In conclusion, let us look at a couple of statements from Ellen White and some words from Paul and John about what Christ accomplished by coming to this earth. Hebrews 4, 14 to 16, Since then we have a great high priest who has passed through the heavens. Jesus, the Son of God, let us hold fast our confession, for we have not a high priest who is unable to sympathize with our weaknesses, but one who in every respect has been tempted as we are, yet without sin. Let us then with confidence draw near to the throne of grace that we may receive mercy and find grace to help in time of need. And that's from actually the RSV, the Revised Standard Version. And what are we saying there? We're saying it wasn't like that God needed to learn something that he didn't know before. It's that we needed to see the truth about God. So he came to this earth so that we might learn something. Okay, does this mean that Christ that learning is because he demonstrated, Romans mm -hmm. 3, 25 and 6. Yep. Demonstrate, demonstrate. De that's God is a teacher and not a penalty payer. Yeah. Does this mean that Christ is more sympathetic now than he, is than he was back in heaven, than he was before coming to this earth? Is he now better qualified to be our high priest? Would it be correct to say that he is more sympathetic than the Father? Might the Father not be so sympathetic in the judgment as the Son will be? Oh, dear me. 
does the son then need to plead with the father to get him to allow us into heaven? That would be pagan theology. However, it has permeated a lot of Christian thinking. What did Jesus tell us plainly about the Father? John 16, 26 and 27. Jesus said, In that day you will ask in my name, and I do not say to you that I shall pray the Father for you. Why not? For the Father himself loves you. That's from the Revised Standard Version. Did, did you read not right in there, Jim? <laughs> it, and it, I do it, it, not it, it, say you read it just like that. Wow. Well, remember the years ago was some the story of some pastor says, if Jesus isn't pleading with the Father, all is lost. Mm -hmm. and, <laughs> yeah. And time after time, this has been read without the not. Leaving the not. We just know that that not shouldn't be in there, don't we? If, I, had, if you put verse 25, it says, in the past I talked to you about in parables or in symbols yep. or figures of speech, but now I'm going to tell you plainly, the yep. time has come to tell you plainly about the Father. And then you go on. I, also in John 14, 9, notice Peter's answer, Jesus' answer to Philip. John 14, 9, Jesus said to him, I have I been with you so long, and yet you do not know me, Philip? He who, he who has seen me has seen the Father. How can you say, show us the Father? Would it have made a difference, for example, if the Father had come to this earth instead of the Son? Look at what Ellen White had to say on this subject. Gary? Had God the Father come to our world and dwelt among us, veiling His glory and humbling Himself, that humanity might look upon Him, the history that we have of the life of Christ would not have been changed. In every act of Jesus, in every lesson of His instruction, we are to see and hear and recognize God. In sight, in hearing, in effect, it is the voice and movements of the Father. That's from Ellen White, letter 83 and 1895. How many Christians in our world, including how many Seventh-day Adventists, I'm sorry to say, would believe that statement? If God the Father had come instead of the Son, what difference would there be? Zero. Nada. Zip. But whatever you want, whatever language you want to talk about. Jesus told us that several times. Why is it so hard to believe? Well, could we ever ask for a clearer explanation of God than that? Let's pray. Our kind and wonderful Father, what a privilege it is to, for us to review all these marvelous statements about your character, your government, about everything that you've been trying to teach us for so many thousands of years. Why is it that so many of your dedicated children, people who believed, I mean, people who killed you because they thought you were misrepresenting you? Unbelievable. So Father, help us to see the picture clearly and to be able to describe it clearly to those that we associate with as our prayer in Jesus' name, amen.